If you weren't here with us last week, you uh, will probably be shocked to know that we're not doing the prophecy update first. Rather, we're doing the teaching in Romans first and then the prophecy update to follow. Uh, if that jams your gears, my apologies. But today we're going to be in Romans, the 16th chapter and verses 3 and 4. So I'll have you stand once you find your way there in your Bibles. If you're able, if not, that's all right. You can follow along with me as I read. I'm going to begin for the sake of context in verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing and says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. I ask you, verse 2, to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Verse 4, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage that we have set before us here in your word. Lord, will you settle our hearts and focus our attention upon you and that which you desire to speak into our lives? Lord, many here in this great church bring with them great trials, great difficulties. So Lord, will you minister to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is part two of a new series we began last week uh, titled, What Makes a Great Church? The Apostle Paul, in ending his epistle to the Romans, greets a total of 35 people, all of whom he knew personally and uh, most of whom he'll name in this chapter. Uh, he had uh, gotten to know them throughout his years of ministry. As you can see just from the text that we read this morning that he's uh, very fond of them, most appreciative uh, to them. And the common denominator with all of them is that they speak to how it is that certain people in a church will make for a great church. It's the people in the church. It's not the building that makes a church great. It's the people in the building that make that church great. And we saw the first ones in verses 1 and 2. It's the faithful women in the church. Simply put, faithful women serving in the church make for a great church. Here in the first two verses, Paul begins by greeting a woman whose name is Phoebe, which is striking for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that at the top of a list of 35 people, this woman would rise to the level of being the first one that the Apostle Paul prioritizes in his greeting. And we're told that she was so faithful and trustworthy that the Apostle Paul would entrust her to hand deliver the original letter, the epistle to the Romans to take it to them. Now, this brings us to our second one. It's found in verses three and four, our text today. In addition to faithful women, what makes a great church are risk takers. Here, Paul sends his greeting to a couple, <clears throat> pardon me, by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. And he addresses them as fellow workers in Christ. And we're told that they had risked their lives for not only the Apostle Paul, but for all the Gentile churches there in the region. It's interesting to note how that 
the Apostle Paul's first greeting is sent to a woman, and the second greeting, the second name on this list of 35, is to a wife and husband team. Notice I didn't say a husband and wife team. I said a wife and husband team. Why? Because of the six times this couple is mentioned in the scriptures, Priscilla's name is first. How's that, ladies? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Let's move on. Now, this begs the question of why. Commentators suggest that it's because Priscilla possessed spiritual gifts that Aquila, her husband, did not. Uh, I mention that because it takes a secure husband to let his wife serve in that area of giftedness and calling in her life. I suppose you could say that Priscilla being the second on Paul's list of greetings after Phoebe further reinforces the role that faithful women play in making a great church. I highlight that again because in all fairness to the women, it's important to understand that in that culture and in that day, women were almost considered less than human. And for the Apostle Paul to elevate the faithful women and greet them in such a way is akin to what we have in the genealogy of Jesus the Christ. And this was, this is an understatement, scandalous to the Jews to have in the lineage of the Savior, the Messiah, women. And by the way, these women were, they had a past. They were prostitutes. They were Gentiles, as was Phoebe. The point being is never underestimate the role that women play in a church and in a ministry. It's also interesting to note the similarities in how Phoebe was a great help to Paul with how Priscilla and Aquila were a great help to Paul in that not only were they a great help to Paul, they actually risked their lives for Paul. Now, I, I got to say, I've never had anybody risk their life for me. And I also have to say, I've actually never really risked my life for anybody. I'm sorry about that, but, uh, but you haven't risked your life for me either. But apparently this wife and husband team risked their lives for the Apostle Paul. Now here's the question. How is it that they would do this. I mean, we know that no greater love hath any man that he would lay down his life, risk his life for another. So obviously we can conclude from the text that they loved the Apostle Paul, but how is it that they would actually be willing to be killed for the Apostle Paul? Answer, they'd already died. They'd already died to self and thus lost their lives in this world. This is not a popular teaching in our day today, is it? I remember when we first planted the church, my wife, being the encourager that she is, said to me, if you keep preaching like that, I promise you, you'll have a very small church. It's like, thank you, honey. Bless you. Bless you. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? If you keep preaching about sin, brokenness, death to self, <laughs> uh, nobody wants to hear that. They, in the last days, want to flock to teachers who will tell them what they want to hear and what their ears are itching to hear. You're a good person. You have a good heart. <laughs> My Bible doesn't say that. My Bible in Jeremiah says, I have a wicked heart. I don't even know how wicked it is. It's desperately wicked. And there's no hope for me because my heart is so wicked. <laughs> so have a nice afternoon. 
The reason they could risk their lives for the Apostle Paul is because they had already lost their lives in this world. Absent the willingness to lose our lives, we, as his church, can never hope to experience the fulfilling life that Jesus promised he would give us in this life, this side of heaven. Perhaps better said, a great church comes vis-a-vis those in the church who have truly lost their lives in this world in order to live their lives for him. Matthew 10, the first part of verse 10 and verse 39, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Sadly, the prosperity doctrine teachers have perverted and corrupted this beautiful passage in the Savior's own words. This is not talking about abundantly financially. This is talking about a fulfilling life. A full life, not a half life. That you will be whole, made whole, abundantly full and fulfilled and satisfied. That's the life in Christ. But the catalyst for that life in Christ comes by way of the cross. The death to self, the picking up of the cross In verse 39, Jesus says, He who finds his life will lose it. Ah, I'm just going to do it. Why not? I'm going to paraphrase so you kind of get the idea here. He who finds his best life now. (laughs) There, you know why I hesitated, don't you? No. No. He who tries to find his best life now will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It's been said that soon one life is past and only that which was done for Christ will last. Jim Elliott, one of the five missionaries killed when bringing the gospel to the savage how Rani people of Ecuador said, quote, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. When a less famous missionary by the name of James Calvert brought the gospel to the cannibals of, of all places, the Fiji Islands, the ship captain tried to convince him to change his mind and turn back. He says to him, this is a suicide mission. These are cannibals. You can't go there. You will, quote, lose your life and the lives of those with you if you go among such savages. To which Calvert replied, you don't understand. We died before we came here. We died before we came here. Thomas Hale, an even less known missionary, who had risked his life in bringing the gospel to Nepal. Uh, Two years ago, uh, Christmas uh, shoeboxes went to Nepal, right? So in bringing the gospel to Nepal, was quoted as saying, the biggest hindrance to the missionary task is self. It's self that refuses to die. Self that refuses to sacrifice. Self that refuses to give. Self that refuses to go. You've heard it said, you are your own worst enemy. Every time you look at yourself in the mirror, you are looking at the enemy, man. Self is the enemy. I think of Esther, who didn't refuse to go, knowing full well that she risked her life, so much so, that she's quoted as saying, if I perish, I perish. In recent weeks, while studying God's Word in my own devotions, the Lord's been ministering to me concerning the powerful lessons 
found in scriptural contrasts. Now, let me explain this. There's a profound and even prophetic lesson to be learned in scriptural contrasts, one of which is the contrast between Queen Vashti and Queen Esther. Here's what I'm thinking. Vashti, the first queen, refused to go to the king when commanded, and as such, she would, in effect, lose her life as queen. Conversely, Esther, the second queen, was willing to lose her life and go to the king when not commanded, and as such, she saves not only her life, but that of her people, the Jewish people. Here's another one. Saul, Israel's first king, refused to obey when commanded concerning going into battle. And as such, he would literally lose his life as king at the hands of an Amalekite. Conversely, David, Israel's second king, was willing to lose his life concerning going into battle. And as such, he too, like Esther, saves not only his life, but that of his people, the Jewish people. Interesting side note, parenthetically, both Queen Esther and King David were relatively young at the time they were willing to risk their lives. I say that to say this, young people, you have a significant role in a church. And isn't it true when you're younger, you're more willing to take risks? When you get old, you're kind of like, eh, I'm, uh, nah. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I, I, hey, I got to tell you, I, I'm convicted by this because, you know, I, like, I look at my son, he just turned 15, he's got all this energy. I'm like, that's not fair, God. That's not fair. I mean, he's like, hey, I want, you know, I'm thinking, hey, that's really, you're going to take a risk. Good for you. Go for it. You know, and I'm, I'm sitting over here going, I'm glad I'm not taking that, you know, <laughs> risk because I'm old now and I don't want to and I'm tired, actually. And so when you get older, you don't really want to, you know, take a risk. You want to kind of just, you know, glide and abide. This, by the way, is another topic for another time, the role of young people in the church. Here's another interesting contrast. We'll see it when we get to 1 Samuel 9, Lord willing, in I guess it's going to be like three weeks now. But Saul, Israel's first king, we find him looking for lost donkeys. And he's contrasted with David, Israel's second king, who's tending to pastored sheep. Now, I know I run the risk of reading too much into this, but uh, I see it as speaking to the contrast of the first birth with the second birth. Now, stay with me. The first birth physically, which brings death ultimately, is contrasted with the second birth spiritually, which brings life eternally. Do you follow that? Could it be in the typology a picture of the first birth? We're born as sinners, which is why we have to be born again. It's the second. I share all of that to say this back here in our text today. We have another most poignant contrast with this wife and husband, Priscilla and Aquila, with yet another husband and wife, that appear first in Scripture, their names? Oh, you've been introduced to them. <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, you might remember this infamous couple of who we were told in Acts chapter 5 had lied and died in church. How would you have liked to have been at that church that day? I wouldn't have wanted to have been in that church that day. It happened right there in church. Now, why do I draw the contrast? Well, Charles Spurgeon, 
captures it when he writes, when two loving hearts pull together, they accomplish wonders. What different associations cluster around the names of Priscilla and Aquila from those which are awakened by the words Ananias and Sapphira. There we have a husband and a wife he, conspiring in hypocrisy. And listen to what he says. And here a wife and a husband. He did it too. He got it from me, I'm thinking. The wife is listed first. <laughs> he says of, of Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife. And then he says of Priscilla and Aquila, wife and husband. How cool is that? And he says of them, they're united in sincere devotion. Talk about literally losing your life trying to save it. Hold back some of the proceeds from the sale of the property. And how about the stark contrast to Priscilla and Aquila saving their lives and saving Paul's life by their willingness to risk their life and lose their life. Here's the bottom line. Try to save your life. You're losing it, man. Try to find your life. Try to keep your life. Try to love your life you'll lose it. Pick up your cross and die to self, lose your life, and you'll find it. You'll find it, that abundant life. Uh, By the way, you'll forgive my play on words here, but it would seem that the Gentile churches were both great and grateful to this couple. And the reason I point this out is because it's evidence in what Paul says in verse 4 of our text, which, if you don't mind, I want to just real quickly reread it Romans 16 4 he says they risked their lives for me not only I but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them now I could end my sermon on this contrasting note but I'm not going to If you want, we can pray our heads bowed, eyes closed. You can leave now if you want, but I would rather you stayed and this because there's good reason. Chiefly because of the paramount importance of identifying when it was and where it was that they had actually, literally risked their lives for the Apostle Paul. I'm of the belief that this sincerely devoted and united couple, as Spurgeon refers to them, risked their lives in Ephesus as recorded in Acts. Though not by name, I believe it was them. Actually, we're first introduced to Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18, where we're told they were tent makers, both like Paul and with Paul. In other words, they had a day job. Acts 18, 1 through 3 says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. In other words, they were in business together. They were associates together. And I point this out because of the tent making component if you will and how lay leaders in a church also make for a great church in all of my years serving the Lord many of them were as a businessman as a layman and I had my tent making business and job and career on the side and then I would do Bible studies you know, two times a week in addition to working in the the corporate world. If you'll just indulge me uh, just for a bit, I want to take it a step further and suggest that it's the Priscilla's and the Aquila's in the church today that make for a great church in our day, and here's why. They were married. Wow, Pastor, that's really profound. (laughs) I realize that's a firm grasp of the obvious, but what oftentimes is not so obvious are how the model marriages in the church also make for a great church. This is why our upcoming celebration is not just a celebration of my 
wife's and my marriage for 25 years is a celebration of marriage, the covenant of marriage. And make no mistake about it, this same-sex marriage special session that commences tomorrow, this is far-reaching more than just a law that legalizes this perversion and wickedness. This is an all-out assault on marriage. Why does Satan hate marriage so much? And particularly the Christian marriage. Because it's a microcosm of our marriage to the Lamb. Let me say the same thing again in a different way. Satan hates your marriage. He hates your marriage and he will do everything and stop at nothing to destroy your marriage. Never get comfortable and rest on your laurels. This is something that's, you know, my wife and I are, you know, talking about. By the way, we have a perfect marriage because, you know, I'm a godly man. And that's why, and, you know, I'm the pastor, of course, and you want your pastor to have a perfect marriage, right? Okay, don't come to second service because we don't have a perfect marriage. But anyway, the point being, <laughs> the point being is, you think Satan's saying up there, no, he's not up there. He's down there saying, uh, oh, J.D. and Kelly, mercy, they, they've been married for 25 years. You know what? I don't think we can get to them. No. He turns it up, man. He cranks it up. You see J.D. and Kelly over here, they're about ready to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and the attack is more intense, and it's more intense by virtue of the fact that I'm the pastor of a church. Smite the shepherd, scatter the sheep. Smite the shepherd's marriage, you scatter the sheep's marriage. Today in prayer, in our prayer meeting, uh, we prayed for marriages in this church. Never take your, for granted your marriage, husband and wife. Oh, pardon me, wife and husband. <laughs> Never take for granted your marriage. Husbands, don't take your wives for granted. Wives, don't take your husbands for granted. Don't take your marriages for granted. Even if you've been married for 25 or 50 years, never take your marriage for granted. Okay, where was I here? We were somewhere in Romans. Um, let's get back to the account. Where? Don't look at your watches. Um, oh, we're almost done. Um, okay, so it's found in Acts chapter 19, verses 23 through 41. In lieu of reading the narrative, I want to quickly give you the backstory, and then I'll try to, in closing, uh, connect the dots and fill in the blanks. It all started in verse 23 when we're told that there arose a great disturbance about the way. In other words, Christianity and the Christians there. And it escalates into a full-on riot. And it seems that, and I love this about Paul, everywhere he goes, a disturbance was soon to follow. And what I love about Paul is, not only was he not disturbed by the disturbances he disturbed, he enjoyed disturbing with disturbances. <laughs> However, what's disturbing is that a guy by the name of Demetrius who's a financially successful businessman, is disturbed by Paul's preaching because he's losing money as a result of Paul's preaching. And it's because Paul was preaching that man-made gods are no gods at all. And here's the problem. Demetrius just so happens to be in the business of making these little gods, these Artemis gods and these shrines. And so here comes this preacher, the Apostle Paul, and he's preaching that uh, these are not gods. And boy, that would uh, take a bite out of your uh, prophet, wouldn't it? And that's why he was so furious. And they become so furious that they start shouting. And this is what sparks the riot. And what does Paul do? He runs for fear in, for his life. No. <laughs> he risks his life. He runs into it, not away from it. Fearlessly. Why? He could lose his life. He's already lost his life. He's already lost his life. And he stopped in his effort to rush into the middle of this chaotic situation. And he stopped. Who stops him? I'm so glad you asked. 
I believe it was Priscilla and Aquila. And that's when and where they risked their lives for him. And here's how I get there. Luke records that as Paul rushes into this riot to get before the crowd, he's stopped by his companions and disciples. And we're told this in Acts 19, verses 28 through 30. Now, it's at this time that everyone's thrown into confusion. They're shouting just to shout. Does that sound like some marriages? <laughs> you, ever, you ever been arguing with your wife? Not me, of course. I'm just talking theoretically here. But here, argue with your wife, guys. And in the throes of it, you're yelling and you're in the flesh and then you forget what you were arguing about. No? Yeah, it doesn't happen to me either. But uh, it happened here. <laughs> and then a man by the name of Alexander, who's not our friend, by the way, tries to silence them so he can make a defense. But... It's to no avail. And we're told that they shouted, get this, for two hours. Where, where was Paul? Well, all the while, Paul, who's been stopped and removed from a potentially perilous and even deadly situation, has to undoubtedly listen to them shouting for two hours, but not close in proximity to where the danger was. And who was there with him? I believe it was... Priscilla and Aquila. They saved his life. And maybe there was another time, but this is the one time that I believe Paul was referring to as he calmly and prayerfully waited it out as it played out. Had they not risked their lives, he wouldn't have done that. Had they refused to take this risk, I wonder whether or not this would have played out and worked out as Paul, who's saved, waited it out. Here's the bottom line, and I'll close. Show me a great church, and I'll show you a church that has risk takers who have already lost their lives in that church. And like Esther would say, you know what? <laughs> if I perish, I perish. Has the Lord impressed upon your heart something, one thing. And it's a risky thing. And you're counting the cost. It's something He's calling you to do, leading you to do, wanting you to do. What are you going to do? Are you going to take the risk? Or are you going to play it safe? Close to the cuff. Try to preserve your life. Or are you just with reckless abandon for Him going to step out by faith? I promise you, if you will do that, you will A, have the time of your life, and B, hang on for dear life. And I say that because that's what I said to the Lord when we moved here and took the risk to start this church and start all over. And I even remember saying to the Lord, if I perish, I perish. But what have I got to lose? I've already lost my life. I got nothing to lose in this life. Take the risk. Boy, am I glad I did. If I didn't, somebody else would be the pastor of this church, man. <laughs> hey, why don't you all stand? We'll pray and then we'll have our prophecy update. I'll have you out of here by noon with second service, no problem. <laughs> Loving Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for this chapter in your word, and thank you for the example that we have here in your word with these risk takers. Lord, we want to have it be said of us that we've lost our lives. We've laid down our lives. We've picked up the cross. We're following you, taking a risk for you. Lord, would you enable us by the Holy Spirit to do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.